hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Really excited that uh, we have a limited time. They ran our clock during that uh, that that little uh, technical glitch there. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, needs to be told in the room that we're in a really exciting time for marijuana as a business. I'm going to avoid puns like blazing a trail in startups or growth industry, uh, but there's a serious blue ocean opportunity, and it's really exciting to have two people here who already have boots on the ground and cash flow. Um, so, uh, Denisha, Brennan, thank you so much for being here. Uh, real quick, tell me a little bit about how you guys are starting to create one of the first ever, and it's a lifestyle. It's not just, we're not talking about dispensaries or delivery. It's a lifestyle brand around marijuana. Is that right? Yes. I think what the, in, the most interesting thing about what's happening with Marley Natural right now is we have an opportunity to connect a brand, a product, that represents a movement that is a lifestyle that deals with peace, love, justice, unity. So this product is inspiring all of these elements that humanity really needs. So you, right before we hopped on, you said one of the most amazing things, and I'm almost sorry we didn't save it for the, the main stage, but I, I, want, I want to hear it again for everybody's benefit. You said some of the most amazing things about um, specifically and I, I know uh, everybody is familiar with the, the Marley legacy, but specifically about the power of nation building. And you yeah. talked about the power of money to create social change. Yes, yes. I mean, here, what's happening now, my grandfather said something very prolific, and we see it manifesting right now. Cannabis, or ganja, as we say in Jamaica. Ganja is the healing of the nation, physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. In Jamaica, Cannabis was the first way that the black man was able to make money outside of the colonial system. So today, when we're looking at how, how are we going to shape this cannabis industry, we do it the right way. So we don't have questions like, well, you know, you have so many people of this color who are leading the cannabis industry right now and people of this color who need justice. We connect the dots. And I think that's the great opportunity that Marley Natural has right now. What do you say, Brendan? I, I agree. <clears throat> you know, it, it's a um, prohibition has caused so much harm. Um, you know, our investors come from around the world. They're, they're looking for a social return measured by ending the harms caused by prohibition. And, and they would define those harms in a wide variety of ways from uh, lack of access to medical cannabis to uh, mass incarceration here uh, in the U.S., which uh, disproportionately affects uh, Hispanic Americans and African Americans. And so we have, a, we have an opportunity to uh, see this entire industry, this entire movement, come out of a, a very harmful state of prohibition. Uh, and it's really the first time in our lifetimes we'll see that happen, uh, and we'll see an entire industry emerge, um, not only in the U.S., but around the world um, over the next few years. And, uh, so, real, real quick for the numbers, you know, there are emerging businesses uh, across the country right now. Oh, whole other side of the room. Sorry, guys. Um, there, there, uh, there are currently emerging businesses in places like California and places like Colorado. Um, and inclusion has been an issue. In uh, California, there was something like 1,300 licenses issued for uh, recreational um, cannabis. One went to a woman of color. Um, how do you ensure that there is equal opportunity for everyone moving into that space? It's something that is, has changed over the last six years. So I, I started privateer holdings uh, six years ago, and the first conference I went to in San Francisco, it was uh, probably 98 men and one or two women, um, and not very, uh, not a very diverse crowd. Uh, over the last six years, uh, we've seen a lot more women enter the industry. Um, it was impossible to recruit women four or five years ago, but that has that has changed. Uh, at Marley Natural, uh, we're more than. Uh, more than half of our, our team is uh, diverse, more than a majority of our employees are, are women. Uh, and that would have been uh, a challenge uh, two years ago even. But we're seeing, uh, we're seeing change. The fastest growing uh, group in the industry is a, a group called Women Grow. Um, 
which is really, it's led by women and we're seeing more and more women entrepreneurs in the industry. I think the, the, the challenge with, with women stepping forward to deal with an, in the, in, an issue like cannabis is we are judged a lot harder. I mean, now things are moving forward where we can say, okay, yes, I smoke. Okay, yes, I, I, I administer this to my child. That's no. So moving forward, I'm sure we will see many more women stepping forward and women of color stepping forward to take our place in creating a space for experiences to be shared. I've been locked up for cannabis, even though my grandfather is Bob Marley and the police in Jamaica know that. You know, and that, that, that's a reality that shows you there, there, are no, there are no rooms for mistake in moving forward with this cannabis industry and sharing experiences so that we can grow, so that we don't have to judge each other and say, well, you're not doing it the right way. And no, maybe we need to like give a little, take a little, give a little one more time as my grandfather would say, you know? So when you, you brought up that there is, there, there of course has been for decades a big stigma around um, marijuana use that is falling socially. It is becoming more socially acceptable um, and even uh, it, socially acceptable to openly and actively promote um, marijuana, something that uh, should be uh, legalized, that people can enjoy healthily. Do, does that, is that happening on the business side? Because it's one thing you know, there are plenty of industries that are becoming much more comfortable to America or to the Western world or to the world in general where still fa uh, founders, funders are nervous, are scared of emerging markets, markets, legislation, taboo, optics. So our, our fundamental thesis is that cannabis is a mainstream product consumed by mainstream people around the world. And because of that, the end of prohibition is, is inevitable. And that, that brands will shape the future of this industry. That, that brands can fuel change. Brands can create and imply legitimacy, um, change perceptions of the, the product and user. And that's, that's the point in time uh, where we are today, where still last year, 750,000 Americans were arrested for consuming this product, yet it's also a mainstream product, not only here in the US, but in uh, countries around the world where we're rapidly seeing uh, different forms of legalization of either medical cannabis or, or recreational cannabis. And Canada likely will be the, the first G7 nation to legalize recreational cannabis at some point in the next 12 to 18 months. So tell how, how if you're entering it as a business, I mean, there is, I've, I've seen Marley Natural, there's almost a luxury component, isn't there? I mean, it's a, it's a, a tell me a little bit about exactly the, I, I, I don't want to speak uh, for you, but Marley Natural, uh, there are um, cosmetic products, there are smoking products, there are unrelated lifestyle products. Uh, tell me a little bit about building, ta speaking to, how do you speak to a consumer who is, who wants to be legitimate uh, when sort of the, the world would have them be otherwise? So, um, for us, business is just a different form of political activism. Um, the activist groups are attacking prohibition from one angle. The political campaigners are attacking prohibition from a different angle. And our role as, as um, business, as, as brands, is to attack prohibition from another angle, to create um, professional, clean brands that people can relate to and people can point to and say, this is what the end of prohibition looks like. And I feel, I feel comfortable with that. Um, and we wanted to do it in a way where we, we elevated the brands in the industry because um, so many of, of the brands um, went to the stereotypical cliches and, and images that uh, have been so uh, prevalent throughout um, 75 years of prohibition. And so we, we needed to elevate the brand in a way um, that, um, respected uh, Bob Marley and respected uh, the, the quality and care uh, that he put in, into 
uh, every song that he crafted and, and respected his, his message of peace and unity and, and social, social justice. And I think also, just, just to add on to that, um, you know, my grandfather was a Rasta man, which means he came from the earth. He, he struggled a lot. There wasn't a lot of luxury in his life. But when he came to a point of luxury, he realized that that was all right too. And to be able to find a way to bridge that, I think it's okay. Because we are moving forward to understanding more about each other and telling that story and not judging as much. You know, we are from kings and queens, all of us. And all of us deserve luxury, whether it's a fast car or how you decide to consume your cannabis. And that's just the reality of it. So when, the, and, and because now, be, or because historically maybe the past hundred years, Marijuana, cannabis, um, the herb has had, has had even even throughout prohibition, certain a culture, an understanding. There has been spirituality around it. There have been jokes and shared language. Do you worry that when marijuana becomes more prevalent? becomes more available to the mainstream, becomes a, a, a truly mainstream, socially accepted, when that stigma falls, do you worry about marijuana's legacy and its cultural relevance and its, a, and its spiritual potency sort of once it belongs to everyone? Of course. Of course I worry. Of course I must. Because what it represents it's, it's more than money can ever seek to describe. What marijuana, what ganja, what cannabis has represented for generations and legacies beyond this time that we will never understand. Of course I worry, which is why I have to be a part of making sure that it is done the right way. And that's the reality of it. My grandfather, I'm sure he didn't want to spend so many years of his life out there in the world doing everything that he was doing but he didn't have a choice. It's a responsibility when you know better. So of course I worry about it, but I feel confident because I'm alive and I know that I can be a part of making things go the right way, you know? Yeah. So um, Brendan, you, have, uh, you have been building, for the, for the benefit of the audience, you've been building a company that has multiple prongs, right? You, Privateer Holdings has, ha, uh, in, in its portfolio of sorts, um, a, 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 a company that creates lifestyle products. You have an information database, mapping. There is, you're almost building it out like a media company, right? Tell, tell me about, uh, and the, there's funding and there's value, valuations that are enviable. Um, Tell me about the struggles faced by being a part of, you come from a more maybe traditional uh, startup environment. Tell me about a, the, the, the struggle of entering a business that is so contested. Sure. Um, so six years ago, I was in, in San Francisco in Silicon Valley. I was working for a venture capital bank and came across a, a company in this industry and saw it as a, you described it as blue water, um, saw it as a, as a massive opportunity, um, something that was inevitable and, and something uh, that was just. Um, and so we, we went around the world to uh, various US states and Canada and Israel and Spain, the Netherlands, Jamaica, researching this industry and ultimately decided that it was something that, that we wanted to spend this, this chunk of our, our lives uh, doing um, and that it, would be, that it would be worth it. Um, you know, initially, um, initially you had to have a, our, I had to have a lot of interesting conversations with, with my wife and my parents who are uh, 85, uh, they're from San Francisco, they're a little more 
Frank Sinatra uh, than Bob Marley. Um, and so I had to explain what I was doing and had to have a difficult conversation with um, my, my wife's parents about you know, quitting, quitting my job in, in, um, in San Francisco, going into the cannabis industry. But ultimately, um, everyone rallied be behind it. Everyone thought that it was the, the right thing to do, and, and no one tried to talk me out of it. Um, it's, been a, it's been a very interesting six, six years. We built a company of really four companies, uh, Leafly, the, the cannabis information uh, source, uh, Tilray, which is a medical brand, and then Marley Natural, which is the lifestyle brand. And for, for the benefit of people in the audience who are early in their entrepreneurship, and maybe either of you could take this on, um, but how do you enter this space and build business in this space, but still are inclusive, respectful, successful, and advancing the mission of ending prohibition? Like, how can you, how, how can you work that, those, those, those values into your entrepreneurship? Oh, um... You know, part of it started with investors, so we've raised uh, about uh, a little over 82 million to invest in this industry around the world. Our investors uh, come from around the world, and they're all, um, most of them are looking for a financial return, but all of them are looking for a social return. And um, the, those investors keep us true. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are entering this industry, people talk about it as a, as a green rush, and um, those are the people over the last six years that, that tend to not last very long. You have to be motivated by something other than a financial opportunity because it's, it's just too hard, it's too complicated, complicated legally, morally, socially, politically, spiritually. Um, it's, it's too complicated and too difficult if, if you're not motivated by something other than, um, uh, if you're only motivated by money. And Denisha, um you know, we talk about, there, there are so many fronts of attack on prohibition, right? There's the business, there's the activists, there's, there's the, just the cultural change. What do you think, who, where do you think the strongest push has to come from? Is there any one place that, that yeah. sort of has to be the frontier? Do businesses need to be more involved or more proactive? I think, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it might sound very out there, but it, it has to come from us as human beings. We have to find a way to make money, make change. And within the context of, of, of ganja, business, I mean, cannabis, business has to lead forward with humanity at the front of it. Just like Brendan was saying, we don't have a choice. Look at what we're doing to the world in the interest of finances, in the interest of money. We don't have a choice. We have made, we have criminalized this plant for so long, killing so many people because of this plant, denying people health care because of this plant. Now this plant is coming forward to a place of grace and glory again. We have a responsibility to do it the right way and to heal, heal the nations. All right. Uh, Denisha, Brennan, thank you so much. Guys, appreciate it. Um, and uh, onward with the next panel. Thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah, give thanks. One love. <laughs>